three. Hello everyone, my name is Jennifer Carlos and I'm the Chief International Ambassador for WASUP, which is World Against and Reuse Plastics. And today I'm going to be speaking to you of the subject for the sake of our children globally. Now the founder of WASUP is Professor Gatchard at OBE and he's a consultant paediatrician. He has taught me all the knowledge I need today to teach you about this topic. He's got a certificate in Global Planetary Health and is a member of the Royal College of Pediatrics Climate Change Committee. To start with, I just wanted to acknowledge some of the places where I have learned some of my information from, and so has Professor Gatchard. And some of our slides come from these sources as well. So there's too many to mention to add them all here, so these are the main points. Now let's get started. Here you can see little girl in what we class as the safe boundary, this dotted line. And there are nine planetary health boundaries. If they exceed this safe boundary, then every child born today will be affected. For example, we have biosphere integrity. Deforestation is happening at rapid rates. We've had a 37% decrease in the bee population. And bees are obviously needed for pollination for our crops so we can get the materials we need for food. Then we've got things such as the land system change. So we've got soil degradation occurring, erosion, less carbon capture from soil because it's been degraded and subsequently the loss of vegetation. We've also got the herbicides and pesticides which are killing good organisms in the soil, which I will come back to in more depth in another slide. We've got fresh water use globally, only 3% of water is fresh. There's eutrophication happening. Also, 70% of glaciers in Peru has melted. 30% of those glaciers melting have gone just in the last 10 years. There's also no water and no farms around Lima, which is the capital of Peru. Then we've got the biochemical flows, so the phosphorus and the nitrogen, which make up the fertilizers, are ending up leaching into the oceans, rivers and water sources. And then it's causing something called an algal bloom, which I will come into more detail in another slide. Ocean acidification, so we've got the fish and the coral dying because of the ocean becoming inhabitable for them to live. And then we've got toxins happening from plastics, which is also killing the fish and coral. But I'll come back to that again later. We've got the atmospheric aerosol loading. So asthma devices, which is something that I will talk about, a scheme that we're doing as part of WASOP to try and help with this. We've got the stratospheric ozone depletion. So by 2030, the ozone layer should be repaired because we're using less CFCs because we use less CFCs in refrigeration, for example. And this was all due to the 1987 Montreal Protocol being put into place so that this ozone layer could be repaired. And we've also got something called the novel entities. Now, plastics actually contribute to 4% of the greenhouse gas emissions that we give up. And also we've got things such as pesticides, which is having a significant effect on animals and also humans. But why do we talk about children? Well, children need protection from every sector, but the health of children is not yet in the focus of policy makers. So for example, in transport, you've got a risk of road injury in the environment through air pollution. Urban planning, 25% of children in the UK alone don't have access to outdoor spaces to play. And this means that they'll lack emotional development, behavioural development, but importantly, confidence. Education. If there is education, then there will be decreased poverty because poverty ultimately is made worse by the climate change issues because we can't access education. Agriculture and trade deals. Now, the trade deals often benefit the government, but it's at the detriment of those children. And also through the agriculture as well, being overworked and exploited because of working underage as well. We've got family services and medical services. This becomes particularly important when you look at the points of 
children being abused and women being abused. Housing. 40% of children live in informal settings, which are exposed to the environment, which pose significant risks to the health. Talk about health, health inequalities. Include in the UK is the root cause of global childhood morbidities exacerbated by climate change. We've got things such as war violence occurring, migration refugees, poverty, malnutrition, emerging infections, which is something I will come back to on a later slide, and also the environment through air pollution. So talking on this theme again, why talk about children? Well, 2 billion, which is 20% of today's children, will be 100% of tomorrow's adults. They're ultimately innocent in all of this. 2.35 billion children are less than 18 years of age. 50% of the world's population is less than 30 years of age. The health burden of climate change on the whole world impacts on 88% of less than five year olds. The health burden of climate change in countries that produce less than 10% of the gases, so mostly the developing countries, impacts on 99% of less than five year olds. 93% the world's children live in areas of air pollution above the WHO recommended guidelines. One million children dies from respiratory problems from indoor air pollution alone. Ladies and gentlemen, climate change is also a child's right issue. They deserve clean air, clean water and nutritious food. But a child does not have a voice in these environmental changes. Talking about the changes that are happening, I want to talk to you just about one species in the environment which has been affected, and this is turtles. So the current rise of 1.2 degrees Celsius that we are seeing, the eggs that are being laid by the turtles are being significantly affected because we are getting a ratio of one male to 100 females happening. And obviously this is going to significantly impact their population. And we can bring this to ourselves and the effects that it's having on us. So all of these are shown and proven to be significantly affected by climate change and specifically the pregnancy outcomes. We've also got things such as psychological vulnerability, which we have to take into account due to the traumatic events the mothers are going to have to go through because of the climate change and the issues it's causing, such as floods and fires. This is going to impact on her mental health but also physiological vulnerability due to her suppressed immune system, the impact of the heat on the high output circulation and blood pressure. It has a greater impact on the pregnancy related medical conditions, such as diabetes, for example. But once a child is actually born, in the first 1,000 days, there are a special sensitivity. The newborns essentially breathe the same air as we do, so in this 1,000 days, there are sensory pathways developed, their language development, and also higher cognitive functions as well. But what makes children more vulnerable than us? Well, to start with, they've got a lifelong exposure. Not like you and I, where we have it from now to the rest of our lives. They have it right from birth to the rest of their lives. 80% of lung air sacs develop after birth. But 14% of lung growth is stunted because of air pollution. It has a higher metabolic rate and respiratory rate, which means they're going to be intaking more of this air. And if it's polluted by air pollution, then they're going to be taking more of that in than what we do. They're going to be running around. Now they're going to want to play outdoors, unlike we do. And then they're going to be taking in more of this air. And obviously, if it's polluted, that's a big issue as well. They've got a large surface area compared to body weight, and they're also short. So, for example, if a mum's going along in a buggy and crossing the road and she stops next to a car, that child is going to be right in the line with that exhaust and is going to be taking in all of those toxins and chemicals which are being given out from that car. They've got an immature sweating system. 
This means that they're not able to be able to produce the sweat like we do. So they're going to become a lot hotter quickly. And the immune system. So they don't have as strong an immune system that what we hopefully have, be able to fight off diseases. So if they become infected with something, they may struggle to fight it more than we do. An immature behavior. So if a child sees a puddle, they're not going to think if it's contaminated or what or not. So they're going to play in it. And obviously that can cause serious infections and issues. And also heat. As the temperature rises, the children aren't likely to go and get themselves a drink. So there's a massive risk of dehydration going to occur within children. And the responsibility is left on the adults to try and tell them to take their jackets off and go and get a glass of water. So all of the above are impacted by heat and by indoor and outdoor environmental air pollution. I just want to talk to you a little bit more in depth about air pollution. Now, two to five times more air pollution occurs indoors than outdoors. This is generally because of the heating and the cooking that happens in the houses. For heat, we use things like wood and coal around the wells. And obviously they give off smoke. And if the children are breathing this in and inhaling it, then that's going to not do, that's going to be a horrible effect for them. Now I want to talk to you a bit about outdoor air pollution. Now there was an interesting case, which is Ellie Kitadabra. Unfortunately, she died at the age of nine due to severe asthma attacks. And the primary reason on her coronary report for which she died was that she had an asthma attack due to air pollution. Now, this exposure is actually from birth upwards. And every year, around 7 million deaths are due to exposure from both outdoor and household air pollution. Now, this air pollution has lots of different gases in them, such as nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, but it's also got a thing called particulate matter, and this is part of the polluting gases. Now, if you get particulate matter 2.5 microns or less, then this can get into our circulatory system and cause significant issues to us. For example, if in pregnancy, it can cause a higher incidence of stillbirths. In children, you get more asthma attacks, slow lung development, which I mentioned before. In adults, we get things like coronary heart disease, stroke, and in elderly, we get things like diabetes, dementia, and heart attack. Now I want to speak to you about another impact which climate change is having, which is the impact of heat. Headaches and loss of concentration will start happening when the temperatures rise. And this is ultimately going to affect the children's education and schooling. Heat exhaustion, which you can see here, and also heat stroke. Now, heat stroke is actually fatal if you leave your body temperature above 104 Fahrenheit for over 30 minutes. And just think, an increased surface area, which I mentioned before in children, makes this a lot worse. Obviously, as the temperatures are rising, we're going to see more people not want to go play outside. The children aren't going to want to play outside. So they go and sit on their PlayStation, watch TV. And this is where obesity starts to become a big issue because they're not getting the physical exercise that they would usually get. And obviously, obesity poses a bigger risk of diabetes as well. Now let's talk about another issue, soil degradation and water eutrophication. Now let's get water eutrophication out of the way to start with. Now this is basically where the phosphorus and the nitrogen, which I mentioned before, which make up fertilizers, are reaching our rivers, oceans, lakes, and it is causing something called a cyanobacteria. And this causes an algal bloom across our water. And basically this starves all of the life under the water of oxygen, and subsequently they are going to die. Now, interestingly, 800 children die per day due to coming in contact or drinking contaminated water. Now, let's talk about the other issues, soil degradation. Now, normal healthy soil needs protozoa, bacteria, fungi, nematodes, but these are all destroyed by things such as monocropping, flooding, soil erosion, and excessive ploughing. 
And because of this decreased yield and nutritionist value, and dietary risks pose significant issues to children's life. And actually, they lose about three years of their lifespan because of this dietary risk. On the topic of nutritional value, we've got to think about food security. Now, all of these products here are decreasing in their yield massively. Now let's have a look at this map. The darker areas on this map are showing the more iron deficient countries. And this is because they aren't getting the nutritional value they need within their food. From 1981 to 2019, crop yield for things such as maize, winter wheat, soya bean, and rice has consistently followed a downward trend. And this is shown pictorially in this graph here. In addition to soil degradation, impacting on nutritional value and decreased yield, fish is also nutritionally important. Two billion people survive on fish daily as a source of protein globally. And obviously if the fish is being acidified within the water so it can't survive, engulfing microplastics, or even, you know, the algal bloom that occurs, starving them of oxygen, then there's going to be not enough supply to meet the demand of the people that eat the fish. So then we're going to be missing out on the key nutrients needed for us to survive. The impact of all that I have said results in system, system disruption. So we get electricity issues, transport issues, community disruption, and importantly, the healthcare becomes overwhelmed. So this leads to solastalgia, which is eco-distress from things, for example, drought sea level rise, floods, and also land degradation, name a few. But then this leads to food insecurity and loss of land, which unfortunately can lead to suicide of some adults. And this significantly impacts on those children because they are left without protection and people to care for them. And then we get things such as flight and migration and urbanisation occurring. So I've spoken to you about some of the issues which climate change is posing to our world. Now I want to see talk to you about what WhatsApp is doing to tackle some of these issues. Now WhatsApp has really become global. And for example, we now have 22 African countries which Sheku, our chief Pan-African ambassador, coordinates, which we are teaching children about climate change issues and making them more aware because they are the future scientists of tomorrow that can help tackle this issue. We also have many other countries as well, such as Pakistan, Indonesia, and India, to name a few. And I was lucky enough earlier this year to go to Pakistan and be able to teach the children about some of these issues which I've been speaking to you about today. We've also got Sam Jono here. He went to Sierra Leone and with the aid of the WhatsApp Story of the Three Plastic Bottles book, he taught the children in an innovative way to recycle and to pick up waste and not and reuse it and bring that kind of shift into society. Now, what is Professor Gatchard doing as a professor to help within the NHS? Well, there is an NHS Net Zero programme because, interestingly, the NHS produces 5.6% of emissions given off. And sustainability has now been brought into the medical curriculum through Professor Gatchard's hard work. Now, I want to start off by showing you this pie chart here. Now, this is a breakdown of where all the emissions come from within the NHS. Now, one thing that is being done is in the anaesthetic gases, the use of the Pardes fluorine. So this is actually being reduced as much as possible so we don't use them as much because it, in its effects, it is a hundred times more powerful than cam dioxide in its effects that it gives off to our planet. So the more we can decrease that, the better. Another scheme which is happening is an inhaler scheme, which I said I would talk to you about in more depth earlier. Well, seven, there are 73 million inhaler users in the UK alone. And if 
all of those inhalers were returned, it would be the equivalent to a golf car going round the earth 89,000 times. Or let's think of it another way. One device gives off a carbon footprint of 200 miles, which is the average of a petrol car. So obviously this recycling policy is so important. We also have a scheme from working with dialysis patients. Now through dialysis, per session, we use 500 liters of water. So the goal is to recover 75% of that water through suitable technologies. And why do we need to do this, you ask? Well, within 25 years, England will not have enough fresh water to meet this demand. So obviously by this, uh, by this, doing this, we will have enough supply to meet that demand for the future. So I just want to summarize by showing you this. This child really has no chance because she'd been impacted in every angle. Got starvation occurring, mass migration because of this, abuse to the child, got war that's going to occur, and ultimately poverty as well to the child. But I want to draw your attention to over this side here. Increasing vector-borne diseases, for example, through mosquitoes, malaria, and dengue fever, which is going to impact on the child. But this leads me on to, what's about pandemics? Well, as man comes closer to animals, due to the loss of land, due to deforestation, fires and floods, and ultimately there's going to be more poverty because of climate change issues affecting people. So they're going to turn to animals that are essentially free that we don't usually eat. So then animals carry zoonistic diseases. So as we start eating other animals that we don't usually eat, it's going to start being an animal to human transition. And this is going to lead to the pandemic. And for example, we've just had one over the past two years with COVID from bat soup in Wuhan, as an example. So in summary, climate change impacting on us and our future generations in 10 words. It's real, it's us. Scientists agree, it's catastrophic but there's hope. And in the famous words of Albert Einstein, he said the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by, by those who watch them without doing anything. But we still have the ink in the pen to change the ending. And ultimately, it's for your future, my future, but importantly, their future. Thank you for listening.